from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. And man, is there a lot to discuss today. We need a fourth hour today for sure. Today we've got a lot of news. First of all, the judge, Arthur Engeron, uh, had to uh, adhere to an appeals court's decision to slash the fine on President Trump, the bond request, from $454 million, nearly half a billion dollars, to $175 million. Uh, So big win for Trump. Excuse me. Then uh, we've got this big, big story uh, with respect to Sean Diddy Combs. Uh, We've got that. We're going to talk about that in a moment. We also uh, are going to get an update on what happened with this shooting that occurred in Moscow uh, was it a false flag? Was it the real deal? We're going to go in depth with General Blaine Holt. He's coming up a little bit later. And um, we're also going to connect with uh, America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, shortly, uh, should he be available. I know he's very busy doing a million different things, but I think we, he's going to squeeze out a few minutes to give us a call. So we're going to chat with him in a moment. But what I want to get to right now, big story, Sean Puff Daddy Combs. So there were these raids with respect to an investigation on trafficking, human trafficking. And they raided two, not one, but two of his homes, his home in Los Angeles and his home in Miami. Listen to this. The rapper and music executive perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. He got some shots of a few people coming out of the home. Those people have been detained. Now, we're trying to still connect the dots. We do have some sources on scene here that we're getting this information from. We were actually the first ones here with about 30 different law enforcement vehicles at least. There are three Bearcats on scene here to that home that is registered to Bad Boy Films, which is part of Bad Boy Entertainment. And the home in particular is registered not only to Bad Boy Films, but to one of P. Diddy's daughters. They are heavily armed and uh, they've been very tactful, would probably be the best word to use as they uh, made entry into this home uh, this afternoon. We actually watched them as they made through their made their way through one of these uh, side gates. And as soon as they got inside the home, one of the things that first things they did was made their way into this garage that you see is open right there. Now, they did take a couple people into custody. We would witness that. Now, are they under arrest? Are they just being uh, asked about what they know? That I can't answer, but I can tell you there's three people right there that were taken into custody were were inside that home. So that's the report on Puff Daddy. Now, listen, the report on audio doesn't do it justice. I saw this from an aerial helicopter view and there were cops everywhere. These guys were like in SWAT team gear. They had people coming out, walking backwards with their hands up banging everybody down to the ground. It was really a, a a sight to watch. It was a real raid. It was like a, I don't know, like a scene out of the TV show Cops or one of those SWAT shows. Very, very interesting. And for years, let me just give you a little uh, background here that I know about. Uh, for years, I've heard rumors about a bunch of different people. And I don't want to slander anybody, libel anybody. I, you know, it's not my job I'm talking about uh, actual reports that I've seen from the rumor mill. On lots of people, from R. Kelly to to Puff Daddy, Sean Diddy Combs, um, at one point Russell Simmons, although he says it wasn't him and there was a setup. Uh, there's actually one rapper, 50 Cent, Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. He's constantly uh, making fun of Puffy for trying to um, get fresh with rappers that are at his parties. Like He tries to get them drunk. and It's the same story as Bill Cosby, uh, quite frankly. Uh, just Bill Cosby did it with young women. Sean Combs seems to do it with men. And there's been rumors about this forever. I don't know how true it is or not, but seeing this is yikes, right? We know a couple of uh, months ago, his ex-girlfriend of uh, quite a long time, Cassie, filed a lawsuit against him claiming sexual assault, sexual, I think, sexual battery, uh, abuse. Um, Don't quote me on those, but I believe that was those were the charges that she alleged. And wow, big, big deal. 
So that stuff went away nearly overnight. And uh, I, I was a big fan of Puff Daddy. Honestly, I can tell you as a kid, I don't listen to too much of his music. I don't think he's really active in the music scene as much as he is in producing film and television and whatnot. However, what I will say is that, uh, yeah, he was, you know, he's one of the most popular guys. He was the producer and uh, the, the hype man for Biggie Smalls, uh, probably one of the greatest rappers uh, to come out of New York City ever. And it, it was just... Uh, just interesting to see that this stuff is coming full circle so many years later. I mean, I had been hearing about rumors about Puff Daddy being involved with um, with um, little girls and little boys and all sorts of things that I wrote off as just nonsense. As far back as I'd been hearing about a guy named Jeffrey Epstein with an island where they kept these children for pedophiles to go visit. So that stuff seems to have come to, to light now. The Puff Daddy stuff is coming to light I think we're going to see a lot of other things come to light as things continue to just, um, you know, kind of like drip, drip, drip right through uh, the funnel. So we'll see what uh, what else happens with this Puff Daddy stuff. But very, very interesting that uh, that that's going on. And uh, it's just you do a quick Google search on Sean Diddy uh, Combs audio or video and you're going to find a lot of interesting things. Now, a little bit later tonight, we're going to talk about communism and how communism got its grip on the USSR way back when it did. Uh, I also want to uh, have this discussion, like I said, with uh, General Blaine Holt regarding what's going on in uh, Europe with Russia, with this this stuff. I also saw some reports. Poland uh, was uh, you know, complaining, really, about what's going on with shooting rockets over our airspace. Uh, are we looking at antagonism from nato is nato trying to antagonize russia is russia trying to antagonize nato is somebody trying to instigate a fight that shouldn't happen um i don't know is some defense contractor trying to spark a fight so they can get rich in the process i don't know uh but we're going to get to the bottom of it with general blaine holt when he comes back uh, when he when he uh, joins the show excuse me and of course straight ahead we've got america's mayor rudy giuliani don't go anywhere i'm rich this Valdez. is america Night with Rich Valdez. Uh, by the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations. I had somebody. It's always nice to check. I like to see, even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing. Are people listening, right? That's but you're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Yeah, a lot of things happened today. This is all about election interference. This is all Biden run things, meaning Biden and his thugs, because I don't know if he knows he's alive. And it's a shame. It's a shame what's happening to our country. This is election interference. They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. We've never had anything like it, certainly not at this level, but we've really had nothing like it that I've been able to find. It does happen a lot in third world countries, banana republics. If you look at uh, what we just left, you had a you have a case which they're dying to get this thing started. The judge cannot go faster. He wants to get it started so badly. And there's tremendous corruption. That is President Donald Trump outside of the courtroom uh, blasting Judge Angeron. And he is also um, praising the appeals court for the decision, slashing the bond amount by some 64 percent and claiming that he's going to put the bond up in cash. Now, somebody who's been following this and is tangentially involved in this is none other than somebody who's taken on foreign terrorists like FARC, somebody who's taken on people in New York City like the mob, somebody who held America together right after the 9-11 attacks, somebody who rose to the challenge to defend the president when he was railroaded out of an election. And that person is none other than America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani. Welcome to the program, sir. Oh, how how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, my brother. So let's uh, let's get the amen to that. Uh, let's talk about your reaction to uh, what you just heard President Trump say. Well, I think that uh, the whole case is 
frightening to me as a lawyer, a New Yorker, an American, uh, as are all the cases against him. They are fictions, uh, things I never thought could happen in America. For example, in the case of Judge Angeron, how does he come to $454 million? What is it based on? Uh, to, to have uh, damages in a case, you have to have uh, some evidence. So there was no loss. The loss was zero. Right. There were actual evidence of some gains by the banks. So what is, he actually just pulled that number out of the air and kept adding to it. It has no reference to any of the evidence in the case. So even the reduction to one, what was it, 175? I mean, the, the appellate division, it's great they, they reduced it, and it's the amount of money that would be easier for Trump to ha handle, but it's also a fiction. What's that based on? <laughs> right. The, the, the original amount is based on no loss and a gain, and the reduction is based on the original unfair guess is just a little too high, so let's make it lower. This judge has been appealed now, I think, seven times in this case, which is very unusual to have that many appeals before the case is completed. He's been reversed every time. I've never heard of that. I've never Me heard either. Of a judge reversed seven times in a case. You would think by the fifth time they take the case away from him, right? One would hope. But obviously he's got a stranglehold on it, just like these uh, people that are coming after you and your law license. New York seems to be the wild, wild west for lawfare. Well, it's called the Democrat Party that controls New York, like it does Chicago, as if it were a communist uh, province. There's only one party here. A, a simple example, Judge Engeron has been elected three times. Wow, that's a Democratic choice, small d, except hmm. he never had an opponent. Because the Democratic Party doesn't allow opponents for judges in New York. Wow. It's because we're really not a democracy. We're a democratic uh, fascist state. The uh, county leaders appoint the judges. And uh, the best that can be said for that is the county leaders get anything they want. In a political case, there's no way any of these judges could rule for Trump. Their career would be over. If the Bar Association didn't disbar me and uh, threw the case out, whoever did it would be finished. Their career would be over. Any hope that we could see that happen to Judge Engeron? Uh, no. Judge en en Engeron uh, has committed all kinds of ethical violations. His, his law clerk is a walking et ethical violation. She uh, ran for office. As a partisan Democrat, she carried petitions as a partisan Democrat. I mean, she has so many violations of the judicial ethics rules for a person working in the judiciary who shouldn't be involved in partisan politics. It's an embarrassment. But nobody will bring a single thing against her because, as I said, New York City is a Democratic, New York City, excluding Staten Island, is a Democratic political dictatorship. Now, I want to switch gears real quick before we um, have to part ways, Mr. Mayor. Folks, we're on with America's Mayor Rudy Giuliani. And make sure you give him a follow at Rudy Giuliani. He's got a lot of different shows, a lot of different platforms. He's fantastic. And I want you to hear this quick clip of audio we have regarding who I like to call Funny Willis. Listen to this. I don't feel like my reputation needs to be reclaimed. Let's say it for the record. I'm not embarrassed by anything I've done. Um, you know, I guess my greatest crime is I had a relationship with a man, but that's not something that I find embarrassing in any way. Um, and I know that I have not done anything that's illegal. All while that was going on, we were writing responsive briefs. We were still doing the case in the way that it needed to be done. Um, I don't feel like we've been slowed down at all. Um, I do think that there are efforts to slow down this train, but the train is coming. So that's funny, Willis. Mr. Mayor, again, a, a case you're, you're uh, somewhat involved in personally. Tell us what you can. Well, I, I would imagine she's not embarrassed because the woman is a thoroughgoing crook. 
I mean, uh, she admitted during her testimony that she took money from her campaign fund, and that was the cash that she had on hand uh, to pay for her love trips with, uh, with Wade. Of course, there's no evidence of that. There's no document. There's no... Now, somebody should have slowed down, even the judge in the case, and said, you mean to tell me you took money from your campaign fund? I mean, isn't that illegal? Uh, but uh, Atlanta is so crooked, that little point just went, you know, flying right by. Because uh, they all take money from their campaign fund. Uh, the, ju- the, judge, uh, the judge is pathetic. The judge is like a weakling. Think about this. Mm-hmm. The judge determined that what they did was unethical. That's why one of them had to recuse themselves. But what they did, they did together. How do they get a choice as to which one? It's as if you and I rob a bank, but, and the judge sentences us to one of the two of us can go to jail. We can decide. The act they were involved in is, <laughs> by nature, requires two people. <laughs> right. And, uh, and the act they lied about, they both lied about. They, bo- they both said, they bo- first of all, they lied at the beginning and denied the affair completely. For which, uh, gosh, you would think she'd be embarrassed at least about that, right? Uh, then they suppose. lied about when the, when the affair began. Both of them did. It's not as if they gave different testimony. Uh, and and uh, she h- hired him. He took the money. He took her on. In, I mean, what do you, you got about seven vacations in, t- in 10 months. I mean, it's a little excessive. They, they, they uh, uh, in my view, uh, you know, sometimes you can get away with corruption if you keep it nice and below the radar. They, they, they exceeded the pig factor. Oh, yeah. They went way too overboard with that stuff. Now, Mr. Mayor, I want to make sure everybody has a chance to follow all the work that you're doing. Let everybody know how they could listen to you, watch you and uh, help you out. Well, they can they can uh, listen to me uh, every night at eight o'clock on X. I have a live show that I do every night. America's Mayor Live. It's on a lot of other places, too. But X is a good place to get it or Facebook or uh, Rumble or uh, YouTube. I'm also on WABCRadio.com at 3 o'clock every afternoon for an hour. And on Sundays with Dr. Maria from 10 to 11. So there's plenty of opportunities, plenty of opportunities to listen to me or to, or to communicate with me. Uh, and what I try to do, I'm sure like you do, is to try to get out. I try to, as best I can, to emphasize the things that aren't going to otherwise come out. You know, the things they're yeah, going to hide. Uh, like when um, when Lake and Riley when Lake and Riley was attacked was attacked and uh, and, and killed, uh, they tried. Now you got to gotta bring things like-, like that to light because th- some of those are some of the most important things that are out there. America's Mayor Rudy Giuliani. The music means that we've got to go, sir. You're a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot, and I thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Good luck. God bless you. You bet. God bless you. All right, folks, we're coming right back. We continue the conversation. With me, Rich Valdez. Don't go anywhere. Coming right back. America. Welcome back. Rich Valdez, we continue our discussion tonight. And on Friday, we had a brief discussion with General Blaine Holt about what's going on in Russia, right? We have what's happening in Russia. The, uh, there was the shooting in Moscow. We got into a little uh, a bit of it. There was um, uh, my questions regarding, is this a false flag? Is somebody antagonizing someone? Is somebody poking the bear to get a response? General Blaine Holt, welcome back, sir. Oh, it's great to be back with you, uh, and a good Monday night to you and your audience. Thank you. So uh, having the weekend to, to reassess some of the, what's going on and hear some of the reactions from uh, those in Washington, uh, 
What's what's your take on the Moscow situation as of late? Yeah, we've learned a lot more, um, as we knew we would over a few days. And we're going to learn even more in the days ahead. And so while um, I have not gotten to a place of being convinced at all that this was an ISIS sponder generated attack, certainly there are elements amongst the 11 individuals arrested that have links to ISIS. That is true. Um, but there's going to be a lot more coming out on that. The other part is is the, the, the way that they went about this attack does not measure up with things that we know that ISIS does. So when you hear these, this has all the earmarks of an ISIS hit, eh, I would back away from that. Um, what I would say is the most important thing, regardless of who this ends up being, is what Putin says it is. And the reason that that's important is because it's, it's what he says it is that guides and tells us what his next actions will be. And so the very, very chilling thing he said today was, not all, he, he knows who did it in, in, when he said that, he said, I, meaning Ukraine, he's blaming Ukraine. And the four uh, fugitives, when they were running, they were making way in the direction of the Ukraine border, which is puzzling if they were really ISIS, they'd have been heading in the other direction. But, but he said he blames Ukraine, but what he really wants to know is who ordered it. And that, that to me is a veiled threat against the West uh, and the Biden administration. And like we talked about Friday, there are breadcrumbs that don't really line up very well for this administration. And the dangerous thing is, is there, the president should be hopping on the phone, expressing sympathy for the horrors that happened in that attack and, uh, and, and offer to share intelligence that we have on the attack uh, of any kind with the Russians. Do you think that this is somebody goading goading Putin uh is it really just ISIS saying hey we hate you and we're doing this uh, it just seems so uncharacteristic of, of this whole situation uh, I know I mentioned that on Friday do, do you see any development in that area I do I uh, there's if you go back to Kabul one of the byproducts of our failure in Afghanistan and cutting and running from our allies and partners and stranding um, tens of thousands of people is that it sent that signal of weakness, um, what I would almost call bait, to uh, Putin to see if he's going to do anything. And he did. He jumped on that. And he went into Ukraine. Um, there is this neocon attitude in D.C. It's very pervasive in the EU that wants to see the Russians locked up in some sort of stagnant war of attrition where the idea is you bleed them and their money and you bleed them and their weapons and hopefully you affect the regime change in Russia. Well, the opposite has happened. <laughs> you, <laughs> President uh, Putin is very much in charge of Russia. Their economy did 5% GDP last year, and they've completely reoriented their economy to a wartime footing. And now the common vernacular is World War III, and Medvedev is running around saying, we'll nuke you. That doesn't make the world a safer place. Yeah, I don't I don't suppose it does, General Blaine Holt. Now, General Blaine Holt, I know uh, I wanted to speak with you about this because I feel like uh, very few people have the understanding of that region uh, as you do, being a former uh, deputy representative uh, to NATO for the United States and your experience as a United States Air Force general. When When you look at this, do you feel like, uh, and again, I'm looking at this as a, you know, with my tinfoil hat tied on tightly tonight. Uh, I think to myself, <laughs> I'll wear it with you. Uh, perfect. So we have we have reports of Poland saying, uh, you know, we, we saw uh, some some rocket fire in our airspace. What what uh, I guess do you see any moving parts here that it, it it looks to me like we're setting the stage for NATO to make a play and uh, or or to kind of goad Putin to get in with NATO so that everybody could turn on him. Um, is there anything to that? So, uh, it's certainly a, uh, a line that, um, or, or uh, an approach that you can't discount, you wouldn't throw out. And, and we only have to listen to NATO leaders when you listen to the rhetoric out of uh, the Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, who um, talks about how Russia must be stopped at any cost. Um, but go back to Victoria Newland before she departed the State Department and said, Mr. Putin is in for some real surprises in Moscow. 
and then go a week later and all of a sudden now we're issuing ISIS warnings for um, the Moscow region and telling people to stay out of shows. And then one week before this hit in Moscow, Obama, President Obama, is meeting at Number 10 Downing Street, an official visit. Those are just circumstantial breadcrumbs, but they're, they're – look at it this way. If, um, if Russia was to launch any kind of massive retaliation into NATO or Western countries, how would history write that? History would write that up as Putin is the new Hitler. Uh, he's the one that caused World right. War III. He was the first trigger puller. He's the one that went into Ukraine. But if you peel back the onion um, – may be a different story. And the thing that I worry about tonight, and I am no Putin fan, is is that we are relying on President Putin to show restraint. And we haven't even talked to him in two years. Go back to the Cold War. We were uh, President Reagan was on the phone with Gorbachev all the time, uh, whether we were at each other's throats or, or getting along. And um, we've just made this a very, very dangerous cocktail. And so if you want to look at what does it take to poke the bear, oh, my gosh, we're not just poking the bear. We're throwing the bear off the stool, kicking the bear mm-hmm. in the head. And um, and I don't think this nets us anything good, especially when you measure what's going on in the Middle East right now. Excellent analysis, General Blaine Holt. Uh, we're coming right back with you, folks. Um, Rich Valdez with you live till 1 a.m. Eastern time. If you want to join our late night national conversation, the phone number is 833 833- Four eight two five three three seven eight three three four Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now eight three three four Valdez. That's eight three three four eight two five three three seven eight three three four Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back, amigos. And to the phones we go. We got Larry in Charleston, South Carolina on WTMA. And Larry, you're on with uh, General Blaine Holt. Larry, go right ahead. It's an honor for this um, Marine Corporal from 1968 in Vietnam, Bay City, to speak to you, General. I, I want to ask you a question in regards to when this war was having the build up and they were marshalling the uh, Russian troops on the border of the Ukraine. And people clearly could see that this was going to be undertaken. That the United States, along with the other NATO allies, didn't marshal the kind of air superiority forces and hiring they didn't have to put in their own um, troops. The, the operators are hired all the time, all over the world, to operate equipment. And the uh, State Department knows about it, and the military knows about it. And these are veterans of 20 and 30 years of experience that could have moved in with, say, 70 F-16s and 70 a 10 Warthogs. Larry, we've got to speed it up. Expedition would be ended. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. General, so Larry, your thoughts? Larry, let, let, let me jump on that. Um, so, Larry, what you're describing is basically what we did in World War II with the Flying Tigers. It is a workable construct, but I would even go one step backwards from that. We had a deterrable war. We did not have to have this war. The Biden administration had all of the elements of diplomacy at its hand to turn this thing off and get them back to the table to talk about the Minsk Accords and better implementation of them. Had we done that, had we come to an agreement, uh, none of this, none of this had to happen. in in my opinion. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate your call. You know, general, we we look at these things and it's always, um, it's always scrutinized in the media. Uh, you know, Putin is the bad guy. This one is the bad guy. But in reality, I think there's multiple bad guys, uh, starting right. with with Joe Biden in the White House. And I'm sad to say that as an American, but it just seems like we're nobody's really doing the work that needs to be done. 
Uh, when President Trump says things like, you know, um, you know, when I'm elected, I, I will end this thing in, in 24 hours. And, and <laughs> I, I understand there's a degree of hyperbole in a lot of the things that Trump, sa- Trump says. But it, with something like this, I think it really requires a degree of leadership where you jump on the phone and you make a deal and you just tell people, you know, you, you let people know where they stand. You use the leverage that you have and you say, hey, look, hey, I happen to be in the Oval Office. I have the power that goes with the Oval Office and I'm going to uh, let you know, here's what we need to do. And here's what you need to do. And here's how it's going to be. Why isn't that happening? It's exactly correct. And honestly, in President Trump's case, when he comes back, if he does come back, he'll have the ability to look back on his previous four years where he was not a war president. He, in in fact, did everything he could to turn off conflicts. And Mm -hmm. so that's a lot of credibility he'll be taking to the table. Um, You know, Rich, a lot of times the media wants to portray warfare whenever they report on it. Um, as a very, very simple formula for all to understand. There's a bad guy, and then there's a good guy, and that's supposed to be us. And you need to pull for the good guy, and and don't don't say anything good about the bad guy. But in many, many cases, especially modern warfare, what we find out is, is in the leadership realm, there's a whole lot of bad guys, and a lot of people with agendas, and all kinds of competing, competing things. The good guys invariably end up being the innocent soldiers just doing their best for God and country and the innocent civilians who get slaughtered on these battlefields. And that's why when you when you look at a militarized foreign policy, which this administration espouses, and they've essentially turned off the lights at the State Department, um, it puts us in danger. And as, as horrifying as the world looks tonight with World War III at the edge of the abyss, it's not even our number one security concern. Our number one security concern is right here at home with the open border, millions of mm-hmm. fighting age men amongst us, and they could go on us at any time. Drop of that. Folks, we're on with General Blaine Holt, dropping jewels of, uh, of pearls of knowledge, if you will. And uh, we're coming right back with them. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. There is more news in your commentary, in your analysis, than there is on the news network. America at Night with Rich Valdez. General Blaine Holt, welcome back. And we look at this turmoil that we have in uh, the in in Europe, and we we look at what's going on with the Middle East, and we look at what we see uh, with China and Taiwan. And where do you think this goes over, you know, the next few months prior to Election Day? We're going to see a lot of escalation, I'm afraid. Um, Europe is on an edge. We see the Russians now starting to take a very aggressive offensive. So we're seeing air attacks unlike any other that we have seen in Ukraine since the war began. I imagine there'll be thousands of troops on the move here soon. I don't know what the Russian goals will be. Down in the Middle East, the cauldron, um, Iran still has not been dealt with. The Houthis are getting more aggressive. They're getting closer to hurting one of our ships. Our uh, troops are being fired on again in Iraq and Syria. Um, When we move over to Asia, we see China absolutely imploding on itself for a multitude of crises, mostly economic. But they're getting to the places, the very dark places of depression, famine, widespread uh, disease. And uh, if the CCP gets back into a corner, they become more dangerous, not less dangerous. And so the, the world is a bubbling cauldron with the United States that is adrift and has zero strength in it and no inclination whatsoever to diplomacy around the world. In fact, we saw the farce today in the U.N. of uh, gapping ourselves from our closest ally and uh, creating political havoc in the Israeli system when they're in an existential fight for themselves. And then we've got our own problems here at home, as I said, with the uh, illegal immigration here and fighting age men amongst us, many from terror cells. Uh, It was just released today that the FBI does admit that the Venezuelans who came here are mostly out of prisons. Um, We have our own threats here to deal with, and they outnumber our military. So we have our hands full, and we won't forget where this comes from. It comes from 
this administration, their policies, and the agencies that seem to have overlooked their oath of office to the Constitution of the United States. You know, Blaine Holt, this is a scary proposition for for most Americans. We had a guest on this program uh, who's uh, an expert in these um, Venezuelan gangs. Uh, In fact, the gangs became so powerful, uh, they because they were given power by the Chavez regime and the Maduro regime. Mm -hmm. And they were allowed to take over prisons. And in effect, they took the gang leaders and made them de facto wardens. And now these gangs are flooding America because they've emptied these prisons. And we see reports of their their crime, violent crime going down. We see reports of our violent crime going up. And that's just one such instance, right? I saw one social media post. Again, I can't really uh, give attribution or, or even validate it. But mm-hmm. uh, somebody like snuck a shot of somebody's paperwork next to them. And it was showing that the Venezuelan passenger next to them was... Uh, a former um, member of the Venezuelan military. And it, right. it just begs the question, you know, it's not only are these men, you know, of fighting age, some of these men are former military. And yep. I, 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 I can't help but think, what, what do you do when you have 7 million or 8 or 9 million new people, uh, a good amount of which are, are men of fighting age, um, hearing that the shelters that we have in New York City no longer have uh, many women and children in them. In fact, they're just men, men from Northern Africa, men from Venezuela and and other parts of the world, even Asia, uh, China in particular. What does this look like to you if you had to read the tea leaves? I will tell you how this starts. It's uh, they're funded right now by the U.N. IOM mission, which, by the way, is led by a former Obama administration official. They get their twenty two hundred dollars a month on a on a card. They're getting ready. There were some of them are awaiting orders from the cells that they're supposed to activate on. And and then when the U.N. turns that money off for all of them, well, then they're going to get really bad really quickly. And we can see the violence, the theft and the debauchery that will come from that. I wish I could sugarcoat that more. I say these words so strongly because I want our citizens to prepare themselves. I want our citizens to engage their elected leaders to say this won't stand. This is unacceptable. And um, and I'm already hearing reports across the nation of people who are now taking road trips like they normally do at all hours of the night. And they're saying it is so dangerous to go from point A to point B in America at night now. Um, because they're all over the truck stops, they're all over uh, these places, and 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 there's a lot of crime going on. And you know, several of these states that are high crime states, they have stopped reporting to the FBI because they changed those rules years ago. And and so nobody's looking out for us. It's an Article Four, um, Section Four, Article Four violation of the Constitution. They're not providing for the security of the United States. So Americans would do well to ask, well, then what do we? What, what are you? What, what is your role in all of this? Um, but, but tonight America is in grave danger. Blaine Holt, uh, take a moment and let everybody that's listening know how they can keep up to speed with the great work that you're doing, uh, with, uh, restore Liberty and everything else that you do. Well, you can always find me and thank you for that at restore hyphen liberty.org. Uh, you can find me at Newsmax. I'm on every day. And, uh, I also have a blog that I write at Newsmax once a week. It's called The Irascible Disruptor, and I'm there on Twitter as well. Outstanding. Blaine Holt, as always, you are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. I thank you for staying up late with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rich. It's always a pleasure. You bet. All right, folks, Godspeed to General Blaine Holt. And again, we come back. We continue our conversations this evening. Plenty to discuss. Don't go anywhere. I am Rich Valdez, and we're coming right back. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez.
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to hour number two of the program. If you want to join our late-night national town hall conversation, give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And I want to uh, bring your attention to a, a particular headline because an appeals court in New York City has paused the civil fraud judgment against uh, President Trump, reducing his bond from $454 million to $175 million. Uh, that's a, I think that's a 64% uh, reduction in the bond. So big win for the Trump team today. And um, uh, we played his remarks earlier on in the first hour. Uh, one reporter asked President Trump, uh, saying, uh, how do you plan to make the, the bond payment. And he said, I'm going to make it in cash, cash. <laughs> and he went on to talk about how much cash he actually has. And uh, it was it was quite the um, the press conference it was very short, but it was um, it was pretty um, poignant, if you know what I mean, in true Trump fashion. Uh, listen to this. Uh, can you give us a little bit more detail about the timing of when you plan to secure the bond and how exactly you're planning to pay the bond? Well, as I say, I have a lot of cash. You know I do because you looked at my statements. I mean, you've been examining my statements for a long time, and I have much more than that in cash. But I would also like to be able to use some of my cash to get elected. They don't want me to use my cash to get elected. They don't want that. They don't want me taking cash out to use it for the campaign. And they looked at it, and this judge looked at it, and he's part of the whole deal. And why well, he's such a disgrace for this city. Again, the most overturned judge. There's never been that we can find a, a case where a judge has been overturned now five times. It was four times. Now it's five times. So that's Trump's uh, remarks on how he's going to use cash to post the bond. And uh, good for him. I'm glad that he got a win in court today. Uh, I'm sure that his critics are thinking, oh, my gosh, how does he keep, you know, weaseling his way out of this? How does he do? Well, oftentimes it's because he, he plays above board uh, while, you know, he talks a tough game. He does the right thing. And when you look at the facts, whether you like somebody or not, if you do something wrong, you're wrong. And if you do something right, you're right. And every now and again, you're going to get a win because there are more people that are honest than people that are dishonest. And ultimately, that's how that boils down. So good on President Trump today. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We have some senators that are urging the director of national intelligence to declassify some information about TikTok risks. Um, I'd love to hear about that myself, honestly. I, I'm not sure uh, uh, I'm ready to, to be uh, scared to death to say, let's ban everything. But um, I do think that TikTok does pose a threat. And uh, other news, Boeing, their CEO is stepping down in the wake of the um, 737 MAX crisis. That was where the door was falling off and screws weren't <laughs> bolted in. I mean, just just basic sloppiness. And uh, I guess he tried to weather the storm, but ultimately the buck stops with him. So that's the Boeing CEO. Then you've got, then you've got Congressman Ken Buck, who we had on this program, talking about big tech. Then I invited him back and he wouldn't come back. Uh, and he was under fire from some of his colleagues for being so friendly towards Democrats. And then he quit. And I don't know what his next job is going to be. <clears throat> I'm sure uh, we won't be too surprised at whatever it is. Uh, but he says the feeling's mutual. He's happy to be gone from Congress. That I believe. I, I do believe that. <laughs> he was catching some heat. And, of course, President Biden. Him and his Green New Deal, that agenda seems to be unending, all right? It's, there's always something going on with the... Um, with the Biden folks. Uh, and now they're making another play to finalize the regulations on gas powered emissions. That's right. They're coming for your stove. They're coming for your gas grill. They're coming for absolutely anything they can, because that's how this administration works. It's America last. We, the people last Biden, China and everybody else first, as long as it's not you. And it's a sad thing, but it seems to be that's what's going on. At least it feels that way to me. So I want to bring in our guest. Our guest is Gregory Wrightstone. Uh, he's a geologist and the executive director of the CO2 Coalition. He's the best-selling author of A Very Convenient Warming, How Modest Warming and More CO2 Are Benefiting Humanity. There's a take you don't hear too much uh, on. And uh, Gregory Wrightstone, welcome. 
Oh, good to be back on with you. You're right about Joe Biden and his administration. And we've got this alphabet soup of the administration, EPA, DOE, uh, Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA just uh, recently in the Biden administration uh, talked about how they were they were uh, lightening up on their uh, uh, regulations on uh, vehicles. And all they've done actually is just delay the two years from 2030 to 2032. Uh, this regulation that would require 70 percent, get this, 70 percent of all vehicles sold in the United States to be either uh, EVs or hybrids. And, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, America has voted with their pocketbook um, overwhelmingly not to buy EVs. Um, they're, 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 uh, uh, if we look at it, um, EVs make up less than 8% of new auto sales uh, from 2023, and half of those were Teslas. I think we've, don't you think we've maxed out the Tesla um, ownership market of wealthy individuals that want to uh, value uh, and, and they can buy these Teslas? Uh, well, you know, I would love a Tesla, but you're right. I can't afford one. Right, 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 right. And, and if the, the, those accounted for less than uh, 6% or 4% of General Motors are EVs. And Ford actually last year lost $1.7 billion uh, in, in uh, EV sales. That makes it, it equates to $65,000. For every EV they sold, Ford lost $65,000. I mean, that, this is, we heard about uh, Donald Trump talking about a bloodbath, and he was referring to bloodbath in the in the automotive market. Well, that's going on right now. I mean, how can they, or excuse me, I, it should be $4.7 billion. I said $1.7 is $4.7 billion right. that, Ford bought, that Ford lost. How can they continue that bloodletting year after year after year? Uh, they just can't do that. People are just not buying these things because they just don't make sense. It doesn't make sense if you're doing uh, any type of long-term uh, commute, uh, any long-term driving, if you're in a very cold area. Actually, one, one eye-opening interview I heard was with a woman uh, in Chicago during the, the, the last cold spell they had. Yeah. She complained that it took her over five hours to recharge her vehicle to full, uh, to 80 percent, not not full, but 80 percent. And she says it usually only takes me 45 minutes. Well, well you know, Gregory loud. Wrightstone. Yeah, it's crazy. I remember the reports. Uh, the, the, it was on the cover of the New York Post the day after that big storm in the Midwest. Uh, there were Teslas all over the place that were just broken down at these charging stations because they were getting close to the charging station. But they didn't make it and they just died and people were pushing them and it took hours and hours and hours to get these things charged because they don't charge in the cold. So how do you reconcile that? What are we only going to sell EVs in Miami, Los Angeles and areas where it's warm? Uh, or do you think that's going to put a damper on on the EV industry? Well, it's actually the really hot weather actually is detrimental, not as bad as cold. Very hot weather also is detrimental. Huh. To, to the EV batteries. But the, the key the key takeaway with that interview with that woman was she was used to waiting 45 minutes to recharge. I mean, who's going to yeah. do that? Right. I don't do If it takes me longer than four minutes at a gas station to put gasoline in my vehicle, I, I'm not very happy. Right. Uh, who, who's going to do that? It, it's just crazy. Um and these things are these these EVs are heavily subsidized, and so uh, we're taking our tax dollars uh, to subsidize somebody buying an eighty thousand or ninety thousand dollar Tesla. I don't want my dollars going there. It, it's ridiculous. And 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 the thing is, what they're doing, the reasoning that they're pushing us to this electrical vehicle market, is because they're uh, this this aversion. To carbon dioxide, and in my latest book, uh, I was on with you several months ago, and we talked yeah, about 
about um, that there was no climate crisis. Well, I've gone beyond that in my new book, A Very Convenient Warming. You know, I I delve into this, the, the very facts that show that we're actually benefiting. Modest warming and CO2, increasing CO2, are leading to uh, Earth's ecosystems. By almost every metric we look at, we see that Earth's ecosystems are thriving and prospering, and humanity is benefiting from modest warming and more CO2. Uh, we, we see that uh, we're not experiencing deforestation, we're experiencing reforestation, that deserts are shrinking, not expanding. Um, droughts are decreasing, not increasing. Agriculture production is probably the greatest benefit we see from modest warming and more CO2, that we're breaking crop growth records year after year after year. And we should celebrate this. It's completely opposite of what your listeners are being told. Your listeners are being told that there's uh, CO2 is leading to uh, man-made global warming, it's leading to droughts, crop failure, famine, pestilence, and just horrible events one right after the other where the facts, the science, and the data don't support that at all. And, and that's why uh, I wrote this new book, and it's, it's really just it's a celebration. Um, it's an uplifting message, completely opposite of this in contrarian, backed up by science, fact, and data of, of this benefits of warming and more CO2. Folks, we're on with Gregory Wrightstone. He's uh, the author of this book, and I, I recommend you get a copy, get a, a couple of copies, A Very Convenient Warming, How Modest Warming and More CO2 Are Benefiting Humanity. Uh, make sure you pick up a copy or two of that one for yourself, one to give away. And I want to uh, remind you that he is the executive director of the CO2 Coalition. We're coming right back with Gregory Wrightstone and me, Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. Amigos, we continue our discussion with Gregory Wrightstone. He's uh, the executive director of the CO2 Coalition and the author of the brand new book, A Very Convenient Warming, How Modest Warming and More CO2 Are Benefiting Humanity. I urge you to get a couple of copies of that, uh, one for yourself, one to give away. Gregory Wrightstone, uh, tell us a little bit more about the book. Well, we've gone beyond what we, the last time I was on with you, we talked about about how there is no uh, climate crisis, and that's absolutely a fact, and that's ba based on science, facts, and data. But we've been gone beyond that to find that uh, almost every metric, we find that Earth's ecosystems are thriving and prospering, and the human conditions improving. Uh, so life is good and getting better. It's it's a huge, really feel good story, completely at odds with your these claims of a climate apocalypse, we find that probably the greatest uh, evidence of this is in, is in crop growth. Uh, we see that agricultural productivity is, is just, it's really exploding. Almost every agricultural production is breaking records, each crop breaking records year after year after year. And in my book, I I, I capture the top eight crops in the world in terms of tonnage produced to find that they are breaking records year after year after year um, at odds with what they're being told of, of looming famine. And it's really from three big reasons. Uh, the number one reason is, is increases of CO2. And carbon dioxide, of course, is plant food. Uh, you probably remember back 
you were probably in fourth or fifth grade and you had a, a styrofoam cup with soil in it or and you probably put a maybe a bean seed yeah, in there course. you saw it brown you, you you watched it you learned about uh you learned about uh, uh photosynthesis Ph- photosynthesis yeah right and so so what you did you found that uh, photosynthesis required water, sunlight, and CO2, and the more CO2, the better. And so what we're doing is adding more and more, and more CO2, which is thriving and driving plant growth. And uh, we, we, we see that uh, just surging crop productivity across the world, uh, and, and that's to be celebrated. And that's why greenhouses add uh, they use CO2 canisters where they ha- where they can or direct CO2 from, for example, breweries uh, are putting their excess CO2 into neighboring greenhouses, which accelerate crop growth. Uh, it's just un- it's, it's uncontrovertible that, that CO2 is, is increasing crop productivity and uh, vegetation across the world. We see that from NASA, satellites are showing that uh, a greening of the earth by greening mean that uh, greening means that vegetation is increasing. We see it from the near polar regions to the equator. Every ecosystem niche across the world are increasing vegetation. And again, this is to be celebrated and it's because of CO2 increases. The other thing that we have is driving crop productivity and vegetation increases is this uh, warming effect. We are in a warming trend. We just are rich. It started and, and, though. And apparently it's helping us. Oh, it is. But it's the key here is it started more than 300 years ago. The warming trend we're in started in the late 1600s, early 1700s. In the, it was the depths of the Little Ice Age, probably the coldest part of the last 10,000 years. And we've been warming since that. It's been warming in fits and starts. And it's quite, quite a long see. time, Gregory Wrightstone. It is. I, I want to pause right here just because I want to make sure people get your website. Folks, it's CO2Coalition.org if you want to check out uh, the work that Gregory Wrightstone's doing. And again, uh, the book, I recommend getting two copies of Very Convenient Warming, How Modest Warming and More CO2 Are Benefiting Humanity. Gregory Wrightstone, I want to thank you for being with us again and bringing us up to speed on everything you're working on. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot, and I thank you for staying up late with us. Thank you so much. You bet. Folks, there is more to come straight ahead. We'll continue our discussion on what happened at P. Diddy's compounds with respect to that raid and human trafficking. Plus, communism, how did it get its stronghold in good old USSR back in the days. Well, we're going to get into that conversation and the book and documentary Beneath Sheep's Clothing with Julie Belling. That's coming up straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. Welcome back, amigos. We continue our discussion in the evening. Again, if you want to join our late night national town hall conversation, give us a call 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And um, a couple of things I want to talk about. Joe Exotic, remember him? The Tiger King from the hit Netflix program. He, uh, he'd he been in touch with the program a while back as he filed a, an appeal, as you guys may remember, after his uh, big Netflix uh, debut. He... Um, got into some trouble for apparently hiring someone to kill his competitor, Carol Baskin. The person that he hired to kill uh, the hitman was a FBI uh, undercover, um, either agent or informant. And uh, then a number of witnesses, uh, many of which were his own enemies from um, that scene, made testimony against him, and now he's been in jail ever since. And then he got sick in jail, and he was moved from one federal prison to another, and he lost his phone privileges, but he got them back and he, he was able to get in touch with this show 
and we're going to be doing an interview with him live tomorrow night. So if you want to check out the Tiger King, Joe Exotic, and an exclusive with this program, Rich Valdez, America at Night, make sure you do that. And uh, one of the things that I, I love to talk about on this program is communism. And I, th- I think it's important because those that I've spoken to that have experienced communism, they have a very unique way of being able to sense it coming from afar. I always say they could smell it coming a mile away because they've seen it happen. And when they see similarities from what they lived to what's happening in the United States today, it becomes eerie to me, let alone to them. And that's always been uh, kind of my barometer when somebody who you know understands communism much better than I explains it to me. And the same goes for people who, you know, write books on the topic, make films on the topic and and otherwise immerse themselves in this uh, knowledge. And it's it's incredible to me that time and again, when you speak with these various experts, they all see so many similarities between what happened back in the days and what we see happening now. And it's scary, but it's real. And I think it's important that this audience is aware of those things. And we do uh, long-form interviews that kind of do a deep dive. So I I try to get as much information in these half-hour-long interviews where people can really take away a lot so they can, you know, really, um, you know, get the meat and potatoes of it, not just the sound bites. So Julie Beeling, uh, she is a writer and director of Beneath Sheep's Clothing. It's a new documentary feature film, and she's the author of the companion book by the same name, Beneath Sheep's Clothing, The Communist Takeover of Culture in the USSR and Parallels in Today's America. Julie Beeling, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. I want to um, dig into this as it's a topic that I always enjoy uh, talking about. Tell me why you decided to write a book and then a film um, about this topic, drawing parallels between the culture of communism in the USSR and the parallels you see in America today. Yeah, so it goes back to um, I was a missionary in Russia in the late 90s. Uh, for a year and a half. And so I was there in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, and I saw, you know, a lot of crazy things. But then I came back to the U.S., and I went to graduate school, and I got a dual master's in Russian and East European studies and Russian language and literature. And I wrote my master's thesis on underground Christian movements in the Soviet Union and their survival tactics and the tactics of the Soviet state to try to dismantle Christianity. And I defended my thesis in 2005, Uh, excuse me, 2004. And then a few years later, I started seeing the same tactics that the Soviets used against the Christians in the Soviet Union happening in America. And so that was the genesis of writing the book. I began writing the book in 2009, uh, finally published it two years ago, and the documentary Beneath Sheep's Clothing will be out May 23rd. Outstanding. Well, congratulations to that. And uh, honestly, I'm sure your PhD is a book in and of itself. I once spoke with somebody who was a a missionary in China, and wrote uh, similarly a book about their experience with the uh, underground church movement, and it was really eye-opening, and it, it gives you a pause and, and a lot of um, insight to, as to how much we take free speech, freedom of religion for granted here in the United States when you actually see what's happening abroad. Definitely. Yeah, it was, um, I spent two years working on my thesis uh, back between 2002-2004, and yeah, it was actually very eye-opening, very shocking to me to to read in depth all the primary sources of the persecution of Soviet Christians, and so much of that even within my lifetime. Um, it was, yeah, the early tactics that the Soviets used against Christianity, because you know they just can't mm-hmm. have any other religion. Communism can be the only religion when it takes over a country. So early on in the Soviet regime, they executed clergy and arrested, rounded them up, and it really backfired and bred a lot of underground um, religious expression. And so after World War II, the Soviets changed their tactics. And those are the tactics that I researched for my thesis. Those are the ones that my book goes into and also the film. Would you say that the current state of affairs in modern-day Russia uh, are drastically different than they were during the USSR with respect to faith? I know that there's a very active... um, church 
in Russia that's very supportive of Vladimir Putin, but it seems to be the only church that I ever hear uh, or, or see <laughs> in the news. Um, do you think there's a, a lot more freedom today, a lot more religious freedom in Russia, or is it just slightly different from when it was USSR? Well, I mean, there's a lot of differences. I mean, they kind of went back to what they've done in recent years is they've kind of gone back to pre-Soviet times where the, the Russian state and the Orthodox Church are hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what they've gone back to. There has been a lot of repression of the quote unquote foreign religious churches um, in Russia over the last even over 10 years. So um, there's not religious <clears throat> freedom as there was when I was there in the late 90s and the early, even maybe early 2000s. But of course, it's very highly encouraged for them to be Russian Orthodox. It's a huge part of their national identity. They've returned to that after the 70 years of, of communism. Um, so, you know, there, that's positive that people are allowed to believe in God and express that, but they'll only, you know, they're not, um, it's not as open and free as it was in the late 90s. Why do you think that is the case? Who's uh, creating that um, those restraints? I think Putin. Um, Putin started putting some um, restrictions on foreign missionaries. Gall, um, it was somewhere around maybe maybe a little bit less than fifteen years ago, and there there were restrictions placed on those different um, non orthodox churches. That's how it was. Also, that's how Russia was before the Soviet um, experiment is it was actually against the law for Russians to belong to foreign churches. Um, people still did it, but it was highly, highly discouraged. So they've kind of gone back to that system. Right. So there wasn't a, a ton of religious freedom to begin with anyway. And, and right. they kind of reverted to, to their norm. Uh, folks, mm -hmm. we're on with Julie Billing. She is the um, author and director of Beneath Sheep's Clothing, both the book and the documentary that's coming out in May. And the book is Beneath Sheep's Clothing, The Communist Takeover of Culture in the USSR and Parallels in Today's America. And Julie, when we come back, I'd like to discuss some of these parallels of what you saw back then and what you see now and your reaction to them. Folks, stick with us. We're coming right back with Julie Beeling. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 833- for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 valdez That's Valdez with an S. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, but I know you'll enjoy listening to it. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back, America. We continue our discussion with Julie Beeling. She's the writer and director of Beneath Sheep's Clothing, documentaries coming in May. And Julie Beeling, part of what you uh, witnessed as a missionary in the USSR in the 90s after the fall of communism you say that you're seeing some of that um, kind of manifesting in the United States today. Tell us more. Yeah, so it wasn't so much what I witnessed in Russia in the late 90s. It was what I, what I learned about when I was in graduate school afterwards. I witnessed the aftermath of communism when I was there in, in the 90s and saw the, some of the cataclysm that communism caused. But then in grad school, I was studying in depth um, the Soviet um, playbook to try to dismantle Christianity. And, right. that's and what you mentioned I, some first-person accounts. Um, some first-person. Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely. Yeah, I researched um, many, many, many examples of religious repression of Soviet Christians, especially, well, what the Soviets did um, is, of course, right from the get-go, they had to take over the culture, the education, media, and religion in order to be able to force-feed communism to um, all of Russia and the other Soviet republics. And so that's, that's what I'm seeing here. Um, if you go back to Antonio Gramsci, cultural Marxism, right. he was an a, Italian communist, and he was like, wow, the West isn't falling to communism. We need to infiltrate their culture-making institutions so the West will become communist. That's the education, media, religion, family, and legal system are the five institutions in particular that he pointed out had to be infiltrated. 
And so what we have now in America is a very, very deeply infiltrated education system, very deeply infiltrated media. I'm sorry to say that the churches have been very, very heavily infiltrated from the top down in many cases. The institution of the family is under massive attack and the legal system as well. Um, in my book, in the film, we focus on education and religion. We touch on media and family a little bit. Um, but what we have with education, I mean, first they had to infiltrate the universities, and that happened decades ago. K-12 through um, takeover really, really um, got took to a next level um, starting in the mid-'90s. And then even, you know, since the last decade or so, it's been in high gear. So kids in school today, like that's nothing like the education I received. I, I graduated from high school in the early 90s. Um, what kids are receiving now, the academics are watered down and it's a, it's a woke indoctrination center, unfortunately, in many cases. Um, and yeah. so we, I cover that in depth in my book and also we cover that in the film. What's the, the, the number one example that you, you um, highlight in the book or the documentary of what you're seeing in the United States that reminded you of, of what you learned about with uh, communism? Well, I wrote, so I wrote most of my book between 2009 and 2011. And then I, I set it aside for many years and I, I pulled it out in 2021, finished it in 2022. And that's where I caught it up. That's what the woke revolution had happened in the meantime. But early on, I mean, I was looking at hostility towards religion quite a lot, um, where you had kids like not allowed to bring a Bible to school. You had kids penalized for wearing a cross. A um, lot of um, anti-Christian sentiment in the media, um, you know, mainstream television and movies. Um, but what has happened since then, it doesn't look like what happened in the Soviet Union, but it is an offshoot, the woke Marxist revolution, where we have critical race theory, queer theory, gender theory, um, not just being presented to children in our schools, but being they're being indoctrinated and being induced to accept it through um, brainwashing mechanisms that actually resemble more. I'm not a, a, an expert on Maoism, but um, it's more resembles Maoism than it resembles what the Soviets did, but it, it was an offshoot originally from what the Soviets did. Um, Folks, we have, let's pause right here, Julie. We're going to come right back and uh, complete that thought and learn more about the film. Julie Beeling is the writer and director of Beneath Sheep's Clothing, and we're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, Familia, welcome back. Open Phone America is coming up right now. Get your calls in. Lots to discuss tonight. Our guest, Julie Beeling, writer and director of Beneath Sheep's Clothing, and Julie, you were telling us about some of the similarities that you'd observed in your graduate work following your time as a missionary back in the 90s in the USSR and what you're seeing today. And you mentioned education, you mentioned attacks on the family, uh, a number of other things. And I think uh, it goes without saying that education is definitely uh, one of the, the primary areas. What's uh, the other area that you really focused on in the film? Yeah, we focus on um, the parallels between what the Soviets did to the churches and what is happening with the churches in America, what has been happening actually, unbeknownst to most of us, over the last hundred years to churches in America. Um, two of the tactics that the Soviets used, one was uh, they actually infiltrated the churches with KGB agents. They sent KGB agents into the seminaries to become clergy. during. This was after World War II, and this was their most successful tactic. And then those, those KGB agents from within the church were able to water down the doctrine 
able to get the churches to comply with different rules. For instance, they banned, um, you weren't allowed to bring children to church. Um, the churches that registered with the government, they had to leave their kids at home. They couldn't teach their kids at home. Um, many other um, certain uh, rules that the Soviet government pushed on the churches and these infiltrated communist KGB agents posing as clergy would get the churches to go along with that. Well, unfortunately, here in America, we've had literal communist infiltration of our churches for over 100 years now, to the point where by the mid 20th century, roughly half of America's mainline Christian churches were infiltrated from the top down with literal avowed communists. It, it sounds so familiar to um, reports that we heard about uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, going after people that um, observe Latin mass and, and other just right. interesting situations. Um, do you, how do you conclude uh, the documentary? Do things get better in America or do they get worse? Well, they get better if we have a mass awakening very quickly. Um, and I do think that there is a chance for us to do that. Um, and that's that's the whole point for me, ha- having written the book and making the film, is to hopefully contribute to a mass awakening. It is happening everywhere, but we need to accelerate that. Yep. Yeah. Now tell everybody how they can get a copy of your book uh, or where they go to check out the trailer for your documentary. Yeah, go to, people can go to beneathsheepsclothing.movie. You can watch the trailer there. There's a link to buy the book there. You can also, we're pre, pre-selling tickets to view the film online. Um, you can do pre-order the tickets there and also get on my newsletter list to get notified uh, when the film is out and available. Outstanding. And I'll let the audience know one more time what that website is. Sure. It's beneath sheep's clothing dot movie. Outstanding. Julie Beeling, thank you for joining us tonight. Continue the great work that you're doing. You are a gentlewoman, a scholar and a patriot. And uh, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You bet. Godspeed to you. And folks, we continue with your calls and open phone America momentarily. I just want to remind you that we have the Joe Exotic interview tomorrow. I forgot to remind you about that in the first hour. I will remind you again in the third hour. Uh, That's coming up tomorrow. We also uh, have had quite to discuss, uh, quite a lot of topics to discuss tonight. And I do want to get to a couple of calls that have been waiting that wanted to comment on, on this topic. Let's go to Al. Al is in Atlanta. W-G-K-A. Al, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Hello. How are you today? Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, I, 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 I agree with everything you just said because in all the movies, especially action and superhero movies, you'd notice there's a distinct change in the uh, 40s and 50s. The, the heroes came in. They solved the problem. They caught the thief. They uh, prevented destruction of property, and they turned over the villain uh, right. to the authorities so that the wheels of justice can turn. But now, the day superheroes are failures, they come in, they cause more damage than the villain. They Sounds like you're that. describing Joe El Baboso Biden. Al, we're running out of time, but I appreciate your call, and I think you're right. Uh, oftentimes so many people today that we consider superheroes may not be as super, but I still think there's a few good guys out there that can ride off into the sunset and make America a better place. Folks, we will continue with your calls and more with Open Phone America coming up right now. I'm Rich Valdez. Don't go anywhere. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to hour number three of the program. Uh, that This is Open Phone America, where you get to weigh in. If you want to join us, give us a call, 866-505-4626. That's our legacy line, 
866-50-JIMBO. Of course, you can call us on our regular line as well, 833-4-VALDEZ. And I want to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, there was a, um, a story earlier today that Sean Combs got into some hot water with the feds. They've raided his homes in Los Angeles as well as in Miami. And at the time of those reports, um, one of the law enforcement officers that was leaking information to the media said that they plan to raid his New York residence as well. I don't know why they would announce that ahead of time other than to give him a heads up so that he could maybe escape on one of his private jets. And that he did. Uh, Puff Daddy's private jet has been reported uh, by um, multiple shady media outlets. <laughs> uh, but they're uh, reporting that a private jet um his uh, registered to him has landed in the island of Antigua uh, in uh, the Caribbean. So um, we'll keep you up to speed on that. But that is uh, the, the current story um, that Diddy uh, took off from Opalaka Airport in Miami. And uh, some are joking online that he saw the feds raiding his Miami home from his ring camera on his phone while he was on the private jet. Don't know how real that is, but that is uh, the current report. Listen to this. The rapper and music executive perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. He got some shots of a few people coming out of the home. Those people have been detained. Now we're trying to still connect the dots. We do have some sources on scene here that we're getting this information from. We were actually the first ones here with about 30 different law enforcement vehicles at least. There are three Bearcats on scene here to that home that is registered to Bad Boy Films, which is part of Bad Boy Entertainment. And the home in particular is registered not only to Bad Boy Films, but to one of P. Diddy's daughters. They are heavily armed and uh, they've been very tactful, would probably be the best word to use as they uh, made entry into this home uh, this afternoon. We actually watched them as they made through their made their way through one of these uh, side gates. And as soon as they got inside the home, one of the things the first things they did was made their way into this garage that you see is open right there. Now, they did take a couple people into custody. We were Witness that now. Are they under arrest? Are they just being uh, asked about what they know? That I can't answer, but I can tell you there's three people right there that were taken into custody. Were, were inside that home. So that's a report from Fox, uh, the local Fox affiliate in Miami, on the raid on Sean Puff Daddy P Diddy Combs, uh, both of his residences, and again his jet was tracked to Antigua. Um, Yasher Ali, he is a, um, um, a blogger, uh, you know, very active on Twitter. He's, uh, reporting that he has sources indicating that Mr. Combs has been detained in the United States, despite the jet, uh, taking off and landing in Antigua that it, he was not on the jet that was registered to him. So all these interesting reports. Um, you know, this is kind of like a modern day O.J. Simpson, right, where we're trying to track the jet, see what's going on. Where is Puff Daddy uh, with rapper 50 Cent Curtis Jackson constantly making uh, jokes about him saying, no, you don't want to get drunk around Diddy. He might end up, you know, trying to slip you a Mickey, that type of thing. Uh, all sorts of jokes like that, you know, very similar to the, the allegations against Bill Cosby. And uh, just the whole thing to me is, is just very, very interesting because I've heard about this stuff for a very long time. And there's been all sorts of rumors about the, you know, Hollywood, uh, the music industry and how uh, incestuous it is and how uh, really uh, filled with um, people that really, really enjoy engaging in in the illicit, hor horrible, horrifying act of pedophilia, and amongst other things. Some say they do it ritualistically. Uh, I mean, there's just a lot of crazy stuff that uh, is going on and we're seeing it unfold in, in front of our very eyes. So um, I don't know the uh, extent of where Diddy is and whatnot, but as we know more, we'll let you know. But ultimately, there's a, there's a big trafficking investigation going on, and he is at the center of it as, as of right now. I mean, and this is, you know, um, maybe this is a distraction. This is what they wanted. Who knows? Uh, but you've got the Associated Press, the New York Post, Entertainment Weekly, CNN, Variety Magazine, Us Weekly, People Magazine. And the list goes on and on, all uh, leading with this story of Sean Diddy Combs 
being raided by law enforcement amid sef- sex trafficking lawsuits uh, in, in the midst of a sex trafficking investigation, uh, raided by Homeland Security as part of a sex trafficking investigation. The headlines are uh, going on and on and on. And again, these these were like SWAT team raids. These guys were dressed like army soldiers uh, with long arms drawn and whatnot. It was uh, really quite the sight to watch this video of uh, these raids that happened, I think, somewhat simultaneously, uh, both in Miami and Los Angeles at the home of, um, I don't know what he is anymore. He's a rapper. He's a producer, a mogul, uh, Sean Puff Daddy Combs. So we'll find out more about that. Sean Puff Daddy Combs, if you're listening, I doubt this is going to happen, but uh, you're welcome to join the program. I'd love to interview you and find out what's going on here. Uh, you could tell your side of the story. Now, Human trafficking, sex trafficking is is always a big thing, and it seems to be becoming a bigger thing. And I remember when years ago when I was younger, it was it wasn't labeled trafficking. Uh, you know, it was labeled um, missing persons. Right? These kids are going missing, and and people always just kind of left it like an open ended question: What's happening with these kids? Why are they? Why do they take these kids? Right? And and now I think we know full well exactly why they do it. And we know that th- there's more than meets the eye, that there are people that get involved in this type of thing. We saw that there were politicians from the UK, uh, members of the royal family that were all uh, implicated, or at least it was alleged that they were involved with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein himself, this billionaire financier, right, who was uh, all over the place, uh, rubbing elbows with the rich and famous all over the world. And everybody loved the guy, including Trump, who uh, until he found out about some stuff that he did to uh, another member at Mar-a-Lago and then asked him to leave. But outside of that story, I don't know of many people that said, oh, no, no, I I couldn't stand Epstein. Right. So these are people of influence. I mean, you look at the videos uh, or photos that I've seen. And again, maybe they're maybe they're not accurate, but I've seen uh, images from. Epstein's private island of a lot of VIPs, including Supreme Court Justice John Roberts and others at, you know, retreats and different uh, events that were held at this island. And when you find out that, you know, this guy is uh, so uh, creepy and and what he's into, it makes you wonder what the rest of these people. Now, there were some reports earlier in this year, I think, or last year that uh, that Trump was was somehow involved in that. Uh, he's vehemently denied that stuff while um Former President Clinton uh, has said, yeah, I was on the plane. I didn't do anything with that guy and blah, blah, blah. So everybody seems to be denying uh, their involvement. And I, and, uh, I would, too, if, if I ever, you know, went to some really cool party um, and uh, decided, oh, crap, you know, I didn't know who these people were. And, you know, that can happen. I mean, that's just kind of how the entertainment world works. I know that, you know, people want to throw a party and they want to bring their you know, the biggest stars and this, that, and whatever, politicians, TV people, radio people, whatever. They want to bring people that, you know, they can say, oh, this is so-and-so and have a really good networking time. But this is questionable, you know. Um, and again, what are you going to do? There's, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that go to Puffy's house for parties and things like that. Uh, but Sean Puff Daddy P. Diddy Combs is in a, is in a world of hurt right now, it seems. Uh, let's see if he gets off of this one the way he got off with the other one by throwing some money at it. Anyway, I want to get your thoughts on uh, trafficking as well as everything we talked about today, the Trump ruling. We're going to come back with a report on that. Uh, we also have um, the uh, discussion around what's going on with immigration. Uh, there's this big report uh, that Fox News highlighted recently about Tyson Foods, how they laid off so many people only to go and have a recruiting uh, event in New York City some are saying that their specific intent is to hire the illegal aliens that are living in the sanctuary city. Could that be? I don't know. I hope not. Your calls and more are coming up straight ahead. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833 833- for Valdez. That's Valdez with an S.
congratulations on just an amazing show. I know you've worked so hard in the industry, and nobody deserves it more than you do. So I'm happy to see you really succeeding here. It's awesome. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back, and we continue our conversation. Let's go to Pat in Sedona, Arizona. Pat, welcome. You're on with Rich Valdez. Hey, Rich, how you doing? You know, it is pretty crazy. It's pretty sick. You know, that that kind of stuff is, is out there, The uh, you know, the child trafficking stuff. But my, my question was to you. I haven't been able to catch the news. I heard that Trump uh, had a ruling with the pellet court in new york city and um what is this court is that three judge court or is it one judge court but it seems like they board his fine significantly to you and i 175 million is still a lot of money but to him that's dimes and nickels but uh can you give me some information about yeah that? well here, here's what i know uh the the appellate court in new york city yeah they did pass this um th- this ruling that, that they issued today saying that uh, they would lower it, I think, a 64 percent uh, to one hundred and seventy five million dollars that he could post in cash bond or even property or something like that or use that as collateral to secure the bond because his his uh, legal team made the uh, the case that there are no bond companies that are offering bonds in the half billion dollar range. And um, the court agreed that if we want a bond from this guy that's really high, then we're going to have to do something that's realistic because, in effect, asking for something, you can't get blood from a stone. So uh, that was the uh, appellate um, uh, court. Now, the the uh, initial court, which is a civil court uh, for civil fraud, um, which is not even this guy's regular beat, this uh, Judge Engeron, as Ruli Giuliani pointed out earlier today, uh, that's a one judge panel with no with no uh, jury. You know, he basically decides exactly what happens there, and and they've they've complained several times and have gotten certain parts of um, what he's ruled on uh, overturned uh, by Trump's count five thus far. So it's it's so interesting to see how this plays out. And Pat, this is really uh, the 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 game plan moving forward. I mean, once they perfect it on Trump. I guess they'll try to use it on everybody. And I would say some could even argue that they have used it on everybody. Um, anytime that the government wants to railroad somebody, I guess they can. And the reason that they're having such a hard time with Trump is because he's got money, because he's Trump, because he's got the clout, the influence of being a former president and a, a big uh, you know, mogul in real estate and television and whatnot. So I think that's his saving grace here, you know, uh, that he really is able to make some noise and he's able to, to get the right lawyers. But just imagine if they try to railroad you or me, you know, what does a guy like you or me do when we're put in a situation like that? I know it's, it's, it's pretty hard to think about it, but you know, uh, Trump's a big fish, you know, and you and I are just like uh, tag poles out there in this uh, big world. But this proves, you know, our court system when you go, have you ever been called to jury duty? Because I have. And sometimes they ask, and I've been called to federal court duty and civil court duty. And I'll tell you, uh, they, they want to know our beliefs in the system. And I always say I believe in the system. I fought for this system. And I today do not believe our system is very fair. I think it's very ha- heavy-handed. We have some very heavy-handed judges in this country that are very politically uh, motivated to do certain things. And I just think it's bad for the whole system and it's bad for all of us Americans that Trump is out there taking these hits and he's doing it for us. And this may prove something to to the people out there that think he's arrogant. He's not arrogant. He is being attacked 24-7 every day. And he has put his fortune on on the uh, on the on the plate of fight for our freedom in this country and his family. I mean, this is a great man. 
And I mean, I know a lot of people think, oh, he just opens his mouth. Well, you know what? If I was put up to that, I would probably do something more stupid than just open my mouth uh, to these <laughs> people. But I'll tell you, he's, he's a great man. I am voting for him. I'll say it right now. I'll vote for him. I don't care if they convict him of anything because you know anything they convict him of, it's got to be a political ploy. And I think a lot of people know that. And every time they go on TV and they ask people, the guy on the street, they say, no, I'm going to vote for him because, man, if they go after him and he's got all that money, we think they'll do with us. They'll just, somebody says, they'll just shoot me. And you know what? That's not far-fetched anymore. Our, our government is not for the people by the people, as it says in the Constitution. I think our government is for an organized group of people who think the they have the idea of what our country should be and how the world should be, and that's just not true. You know, Pat, I, I, I think you're right, and again, I, I want to thank you for your service because we can't lose sight of that. Uh, but you're, you're right. Um, this, this is um, what happens when you're a big fish, and you know, my, my take is imagine what they do to the small fish, and I think it just happens. They just railroad people that they want to railroad, and I've seen it happen. I've met some people that that's happened to, where for political purposes, you know, they just became one more cog in um, in the system. And with Trump, he's fighting tooth and nail. He's a fighter. And not only is he a fighter, he has the know-how in many ways. He's got that foresight because he's been through the ringer a number of times. And he, he gets how it works. And, you know, Pat, you look at this, and then you look at what's happening with um Sean Puff Daddy Combs and this uh, child trafficking allegations or, or sex trafficking allegations, excuse me. And and it's just so interesting to see how the the emphasis is being put on Trump uh, while who knows what is happening elsewhere. And there doesn't seem to be much emphasis until now. Yes, I agree. I, I disagree. They 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 turn a blind eye to uh, the protesters during the Black Lives Matter and what they did to the cities and black businesses. They burned out a lot of their own people for their insolence to the, you know, the police. And they've, they've marginal our police today. Our police uh, don't have, you know, they're, they're worried they're going to overstep. And sometimes they have to. But, you know, a lot of times they don't. I wouldn't want to be a guy behind a badge. I know you have family. They're oh, uh, yeah. all police officers or retired police officers. And to, to go through what they have to go through, man. It's, it's dangerous, Pat. Folks, we're coming right back. Thank you, Pat, for the call. I appreciate it. And a big shout-out to everybody serving in uniform. A big shout-out to everybody that's listening and can't call in. Big shout-out to you. If you can, feel free, 833 833- Four eight two five three three seven eight three three four Valdez. Getting to the rest of your calls straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. Iowa is one of the great American suburbs. Quaint shops on the main boulevard, local produce sections at the grocery store, and pristine parks sprinkled throughout the town. It reached a golden era in the 60s and 70s when Tyson Foods opened up its pork factory and revolutionized the town's economy. It's a relatively small town with strong values and a very close-knit community. It's a friendly community, and if you are willing to put out a little effort, I think everyone makes you feel welcome. Would you consider Perry a good place to grow? Definitely. Definitely. I am, I am really pro-Perry. I like the small town atmosphere. You get to know people. You walk down the street. They say hi to you. If uh, you need help, you know who you can turn to, that kind of thing. But Perry, Iowa is about to change drastically, and not for the better. This week, Tyson Foods announced that it will be permanently closing its pork factory in Perry, killing around 1,200 jobs in a town of just 8,000 people. So as Perry residents struggle to cope with mass layoffs, Tyson Foods has its eyes on a different class of workers, 
The company is now offering new jobs to asylum seekers in other states like New York. Bloomberg says Tyson's tracking migrants in a massive database. They scroll through the data like Facebook. You see a worker you like, tap hire. They even had a job fair. All right, that is a report from Fox News that's being um, challenged uh, while Waters is citing the the um, report from Bloomberg. And Bloomberg stands by that a couple of weeks ago saying Tyson Foods, here's the headline, Tyson Foods wants New York migrants for meat factories amid low unemployment. Um, you've got, let me see, all the usual suspects. The Washington Post saying that this is misinformation. Uh, ABC News saying that this is misinformation. Uh, Fact-focused Tyson Foods is not hiring workers who came to the U.S. illegally. Uh, Fact check from Reuters. Tyson Foods did not say it wants to hire 42,000 illegal workers. Well, of course, they didn't say it. They're just doing it, right? And uh, and this is what what's so interesting about this. Uh, Bloomberg, who doesn't have a, a dog in this fight, I think they called it out accurately. Uh, they're they're saying that they are tracking where they can find asylum seekers. And again, if you're an asylum seeker um, under the the current law, and I say this all the time, uh, while I do think that their their entry is illegal, it's unlawful. The reality is that they've been invited by the president of the United States. So when these fact checkers go ahead and say no, they didn't come here illegally, they applied for asylum. They were granted asylum. They used the CBP-1 app, and now they're just awaiting their um, adjudication. There's nothing illegal about these people. But you and I all know these are people just rushing the border. Come one, come all. They're taking everybody in because they want to uh, disturb, upset, overpower the balance of power. It's that simple. And in the process, and they don't care if they get a couple of gangs or gang members in the process. You know, it's, you know, it's part of, it's par for the course, right? It comes with the territory. It's part of what you have to do in order to, uh, in order to do what has to be done. So uh, I think it's a disgrace. And um, I want to hear what you guys have to say about that and other things that are happening. Uh, let's go to the phones. 833-482-5337, 833 833-4- Valdez. Let's go to uh, Boise, Idaho. Check in uh, with uh, Paul, who's listening online. Big shout out to KVOI. Paul, go right ahead and tell me your thoughts on what you just heard about Tyson Foods, the chicken company, uh, apparently tracking migrants to hire migrants after they just hired, uh, fired a bunch of people. So if it's true, we really are replacements. We're going to be replaced, huh? Now, one would suspect that if, if that is in fact true that they're doing it to save money because I would I would imagine you could pay a, a lower a minimum wage whereas you probably couldn't get away with that for other folks and uh, I, I think um, you're right this is a, a sad truth you know should it be the case that we are being replaced and who knows you know how many jobs between AI and illegal immigration I think so many American workers, uh, should be afraid, whether it's, you know, the robotic version of, of a radio host, <laughs> which in some places already exists, uh, usually on music stations. But I guess one could uh, use chat GPT and some sort of voice device to come up with uh, what they think a Rich Valdez or another uh, conservative radio host might say and try to create a, a AI version of a radio show. I mean, that's interesting, but I could see it happening, and it's scary. So, Paul, um, you weighed in on the immigration. Now, I know you wanted to also weigh in on uh, humanitarian relief funds. Tell us more. Well, I don't know how, if you recall, we had to pay the Iranians some hostage money, which amounted to $6 billion, and they we made a... a an agreement with them that the money was supposed to be put into like a trust and be spent on humanitarian um, problems, uh, specifically food, if it came up. And the Iranians did have some problems before they started selling their oil, and then all the money started coming in, and they they reached the point to where I believe they they were able to spend money on armaments with Hamas 
and Hezbollah and the Houthis and everybody else in that general area. And so that money was used for that. And the money that was not spent was the so-called humanitarian, which was put into a bank in Qatar or Qatar, whichever right. you want to pronounce it. So that money, as far as I know, is still sitting there. Right. In all rights and purposes, should be given to the Hamas uh, Palestinians, as it were, because they're they're not getting what they need, is what we're told. Now, with the propaganda that's going on in the news these days, how much of that is true? Now, if it is true, I would say that money probably should be earmarked for that. Well, don't worry about it because Biden will make sure that everybody in Gaza gets what they need because Joe Biden, uh, you know, started off by saying we're going to support Israel and give them everything they need. And he slowly morphed into, you know, we're going to build we're going to build a, a, a dock and we're going to build a, a marina for for the folks in Gaza. Right. And, and it's now today they're saying, well, you know, we think we should probably have re-elections, uh, new elections for for Bibi. You got to get rid of Netanyahu. And it's slowly morphing where um, the current administration seems to be turning their back on the uh, alliance that we've had with Israel uh, for, for quite a while. And, and it's funny because Joe Biden was, was keen on that. He was keen on this, this uh, alliance when he was a senator. But now, not so much. And that's not the only thing that Joe Biden has flip-flopped on. He's flip-flopped on a number of things. So well, we'll see how it plays out. But I think you're, you're, you're right, Paul. Um, that money's going to end up going right back to the Iranians uh, by way of Hamas, even though they're not getting it. They're going to get it either way. Paul, thanks for the call in Boise, Idaho. And we continue with calls. We got calls from Evergreen, Montana, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Charleston, South Carolina, Lansing, Michigan, and more. If you're in New York, if you're on the West Coast, Oregon, California, give us a call. Coming right back. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Well, let's talk about the election now. Donald Trump says one of his first acts, if he is reelected to a second term, would be, quote, to free those charged and convicted of crimes related to January 6th. Do you support that? I want to be very clear. The violence that happened on January 6th is unacceptable. It doesn't represent our country. It certainly does not represent my party. We should not be attacking the Capitol. We should not be having violence. I said it that day. I put a statement out that day that this is not acceptable. If you attacked our Capitol and you have been have you, and you've been convicted, then that should stay. So then, but to the question, though, do you disagree with Trump saying he's going to free those who've been charged? I do not convicted? think people who committed violent acts on January 6th should be freed. So you disagree with that? He's been saying that for months. I, Rana, why not speak out earlier? Why just speak out about that now? When you're the RNC chair, you, you kind of take one for the whole team, right? Now I get to be a little bit more myself, right? This is what I believe. I don't think violence should be in our political discourse. Ooh, Rona McDaniel. Now, I would have said, well, you know what? Nobody's asked me that before, and you asked me, and I answered it. Rona McDaniel is, is um, you know, quickly going to become the Nicole Wallace and the rest of these people. I mean, look. I understand some people morph politically because of a paycheck. Uh, I, I would be so bad at that. Honestly, I just don't know. I can only talk about what I know how to talk about, you know, what comes out of my brain. And and she clearly says, you know, she was taking one for the team 
uh, with uh, <laughs> RNC chair. Uh, I was always weary uh, or leery of her, I should say. Um, she she was, um, you know, she's a Romney. And uh, my opinion of um, Mittens Romney is, is not a high one. So, Ronna McDaniel, good luck to you with uh, your newfound um, employment at NBC. Uh, something tells me that she'll um, do some Meet the Press, but she'll probably end up on MSNBC somewhere with Joe Scarborough, uh, maybe on the morning joke. Let's go to Jeff in Lansing. No, hold on. I'm sorry. Jerome, in, he was first in line. Jerome in Charleston, South Carolina, WTMA. Go right ahead. Hello, Rich. Hi, Jerome. Hello. Hello. And I'll probably stand up next to you. God bless the USA. You know, well, hey, now, now that was pretty good with Ronner. She did a she did a flip flop like I haven't seen that since uh, I used to watch Sea Hunt growing up with with Lloyd Bridges jumping in the ocean. Man, did she turn! <laughs> and isn't that and a wonderful quick. thing? Oh, I don't a, think it's a I wonderful mean, thing. Probably a good thing for her because she's getting a payday. I wonder how much they how much they paid it. By the way, Tish Tish James from New York, she wants to know where's her money because um she was. Well, she should ask the appellate court because the appellate court just slashed everything and said Trump's got ten days to deliver the money, and Trump said today he's happy to deliver that money in cash. Matter of fact, we have some audio from that. Jerome, I want you to listen to this one. We've got, let me see, it's, there's cut seven, cut eight, cut nine. I'm going to go with uh, cut number, cut number, let me see. We used seven uh, a little bit earlier, and we used eight. Let's let's go with number nine. Go right ahead. You mentioned the cash you have instead of finding something like 500 million. You intended yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now that the bond's been reduced, are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But... Uh, I might, I might do that. I have the option. <laughs> and there's Trump saying that uh, he has the option to use cash or whatever option uh, he wants to use. So, Jerome, do you think Trump is not going to make good and pay this bond in the next uh, nine days? Yeah, Rich, it's none of your beeswax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, I think Trump is going to make good on it. If you want to make a bet, I'm willing to take a bet with you. Me betting on his money? Oh, no. Hey, didn't you hear Lindsey Graham? Just get him $4, $5, $10. The man needs your help. It's our country's at stake. Yes, 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 Lindsey, you are right. The country is at stake. That wasn't that good of Lindsey to do that for Donald J. Trump? Wasn't that wonderful? Begging I don't know. I, I, I didn't catch that one. Uh, the, the only thing I've heard today is uh, my buddy Jerome from South Carolina uh, trying, trying hard, but it doesn't seem like you're getting anywhere. Hey, you were talking about uh, about uh, P. Diddy. What about Trump's comments? Well, when you're a celebrity, you can grab a body, you know why. And when you're a celebrity, they let you get away with it. Yeah, well, uh, the last I checked, when they raided Trump's house by the FBI, they were looking for documents from when he was president. Today they raided Diddy's house, and they weren't looking for documents. They were looking for people and evidence uh, related to human trafficking. I think that's quite different, no? I used to handle classified documents for eight years when I was in the Air Force. I ain't never seen nobody saw documents like that in the bathroom and in this place and in that place. I don't know, man. I, I don't think if he goes to trial on that, I don't think he's going to get away with it. No. Well, uh, I'll take a bet on that one, too. I think uh, the Presidential Records Act is pretty clear. I don't think much is going to happen to Trump there. This is another one of those cases where they're going to bring the charges against him. And and some people who don't know how to read very well will think, oh, my gosh, this is a big deal. But when you read the, the text of the Presidential Records Act, you'll quickly, quickly learn that the president is the only one that has certain rights and privileges and no one else really has them. So not the vice president, not Senator Joe Biden, not pre uh, Vice President Joe Biden. Now, as President Joe Biden has those same rights and privileges. And I think you, you're going to be very surprised at the outcome of that case, just like the outcome of so many of these other cases, even this bond being slashed by more than half, because ultimately they realize that these people are reaching. There's an overreach here. It's a gross overreach, Jerome. I think you know it too, but it's always good to hear from you. And, uh, 
and the, the the funny things you have to say. I appreciate it. All right, there goes Jerome. Uh, we've stunned him with the greatness and my haircut. Folks, we're coming right back with the rest of your calls and more. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. He's brown, he's bald, and he's breaking it down. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. Let's go to the phones, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Let's go to Jeff Lansing, Michigan, W-I-L-S. Jeff, welcome. You're on with Rich Valdez. Mr. Valdez, it's great to speak with you again. That that's Valdez with an S, if I'm not mistaken. You know it. Okay, good. Uh, Rich, you put me on after Jerome, and I just don't think that's fair because <laughs> that guy's entertaining, and and he's fun he is his own people. show. You're right, exactly. And then I have to come on after him. It's like an open mic or trying to open for like a Dave Chappelle or something. You know, it's uh, tough. But- you were speak, you were speaking about uh, 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 the immigrants taking yeah. over jobs. Now, there's a boat company here in Mid Michigan. Uh, uh, a very good friend of mine's son has been uh, uh, a supervisor there for a long, long time, and my son-in-law has been working there for a few years. And they took care of they 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 exonerated everybody from the company. For no other reason, they gave them all severance pay, and they're bringing in cheaper labor. Hmm. It's a shame. It really is a shame, Jeff, to see what's happening. It's happening all over the place. And it's not just Tyson Foods. A lot of people are doing it because this is the reality. And I, I, you know, It's funny. I see these, these videos online of, of folks um, uh, coming at the migrants and, you know, just, you know, attacking them in many ways. And I don't think that's a good idea. Some people think, well, that's how we're going to take our country back. If, you know, if we beat them enough, then, you know, they'll tell their friends and uh, people will stop coming. I don't believe that. Um, not at all. Because they go through a very dangerous trek to get here. So obviously they're leaving a place that's much worse than the United States. But what I will say is, if you go after the people that hire these people, well, then now you're talking they might actually respond and stop hiring people. So that's something to think about. Jeff, thanks for the call. Jim in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Frank in Evergreen, Montana. Sorry, the music means they're kicking me out of here. Hopefully you'll tune in tomorrow. Hasta la próxima. Until the next time, take care, good night, and God bless. I am Rich Valdez.